Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Juliet Pulliam as our fifth inaugural CCC speaker. Um, I initially met Dr. Pulliam early on in grad school during the 2014 Ebola epidemic when she was a faculty member at the University of Florida. And she spent a really short but intensive research stint at UT with the Myers Lab and um, our former postdoc, Dr. Steve Bellin, working on really important work um, related to the epidemiological dynamics of Ebola, vaccine trial design, and um, some interesting ethical issues that people weren't really considering at the time um, related to vaccine trials for very deadly diseases. Um, however, it wasn't really until the summer of 2015 that I got to know her when I attended a summer clinic on the meaningful modeling of epidemiological data, which was a two week course into mathematical modeling for real world problems and was organized by a program she was directing at the time, um, ICI3D. Um, Dr. Pulliam led many of the sessions at that clinic, um, which was really uh, incredible cr clinic in, in South on the coast of South Africa really um, that, um, you know, was uh, it was a collaborative clinic with the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, um, which was a really great and eye-opening program for me. Specifically, she gave um, a session on what was called creating a model world, where she went in the steps of how to develop a research question, hone in on the outcome of interest, and then build a mathematical model to answer the question. Um, her clear thinking and uh, knack for identifying meaningful research questions was really transformative for helping kind of the modeling process click in my mind. Um, so uh, it was a couple years after that that she moved, she actually moved to South Africa from Florida to become the director of SESIMA, which is the South African Center for Epidemiological Modeling and Analysis, um, and was one of the partner institutions of that summer clinic I had attended. Um, where she's currently now as Professor of Applied Mathematics at Stellenbosch University. Her research focuses on quantitative approaches to infectious disease epidemiology, particularly zoonotic and vector-borne infections in resource-limited settings. Um, and really she, you know, is one of the leaders in the field in thinking about the human-animal interface and um, identifying risk for potential spillover events and, and kind of the process for spillover events, uh, similar to ones we, we've seen with COVID-19 really. Um, and I'm really excited to have her here to discuss um, her recent work on COVID-19 in South Africa. So uh, Dr. Pulliam, please take it away. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And thanks, Spencer, for that really nice introduction. <laughs> um, okay, so I am actually not planning to talk about modeling. I hope that's okay. I'm going to share my screen. Um, and what I thought I'd do is just give an overview of the COVID epidemic so far in South Africa. Um, I'm assuming that mostly you've heard sort of more domestic focused uh, presentations, and I thought this might provide an interesting contrast. So um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Okay, so, um, oops. Okay, so this is South Africa. It's the southernmost um, country in Africa, and uh, it has nine provinces, um, and is, um, this, this here is Cape Town um, and uh, Musenberg, where Spencer uh, did his, his two-week course. Um, so South Africa is a really interesting and diverse country. Um, and I'm sure you're all aware of a sort of apartheid as um, the governing system until 1994 in South Africa. And as a result of um, the apartheid system, inequality is one of the sort of key defining features of um, South African society. Um, and just, I, I thought um, this quote from Stats SA, which is a, the sort of national statistics organization in, in South Africa, um, was really interesting because it, um, it just highlights how fundamental um, this is in the thinking um, sort of about South African society in general. And I think this is a really important aspect of what's going on with the COVID outbreak. Um, so I'm highlighting it, highlighting it at the beginning and then I'll come back to it at the end. Um, I should also say I'm, I'm probably going to struggle to keep, keep to 10 minutes, so please feel free to cut me off if you need to. <laughs> um, okay, so the South African population is very different from um, a lot of the places where there have been large COVID outbreaks so far. Um, there's a population of about 58 million, and the population age distribution um, is much younger than um, places like Italy um, and most, most European countries and even the U.S. 
Um, so um, this is an age pyramid showing the male, male population and female population. Um, and you can see there's that the, the largest age groups um, are sort of children and teenagers. Um, and then there's a small dip um, and then um, very large numbers of people um, in the sort of late 20s and early 30s. The other um, thing to know about South Africa is that it has a very high um, HIV prevalence, um, it has the highest, uh, largest population of people living with HIV of any country in the world. Um, the overall prevalence is about 13% and it's much higher in the age um, range from 25 to 44. Um, it's about 23%. Um, and so this, um, this plot is showing the people living with HIV. And the other thing to notice is that it is fairly gender skewed. So um, on the right hand side, you see the, the females. Um, and not only are the numbers larger, but the, um, the infections start at a, at a substantially younger age. Um, the prevalence gets higher younger um, in, in the women. Um, there are also, of course, other important comorbidities, including tuberculosis, uh, COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, and often is a result of previous tuberculosis. Um, and, and of course, the same comorbidities that are, have been seen everywhere, um, diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. Um, so this is a summary of the outbreak so far, um, updated as of yesterday. So there have been over 75,000 cases and over 1,600 deaths uh, to date. Um, the timeline is, um, is shown here with these, these arrows. So um, the first case was diagnosed on March 5th. Um, for uh, the first month or so after that, um, the testing was really limited to people with a travel history or uh, known contact with a COVID case. Um, and after that, the testing criteria changed and um, the, the testing really expanded. Um, and so you can see there's sort of a dip um, around late March. Uh, we think that was largely sort of the result of the testing not having really caught up with the outbreak. Um, and then um, an expansion um, in the numbers of cases after that. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the interventions that have been put in place. So on the 18th of March, um, school closures, a travel ban, and, and mass gatherings were all limited, um, and those limitations have, have stayed in place uh, since that time. Um, in the, at the end of March, on March 27th, we went into what was called the level five lockdown. Um, or the hard lockdown. So at the time, it was one of the most restrictive lockdowns of any country, um, and it um, it essentially required people to stay in their houses um, unless they were going to the grocery store or seeking medical care. Um, so essentially, all business um, was uh, halted, um, and you weren't even allowed to go outside to exercise or, or to walk a dog. Um, the level Five lockdown lasted until uh, the end of April, um, so about five weeks uh, when we went to level four, which was a little bit less restrictive. It did allow you to exercise outside, um, but you were still asked to leave the house only for, uh, to basically to purchase essentials, um, to get essential services or um, to exercise. You were allowed to exercise for three hours in the morning. Um, as of June 1st, we went to level three, and that's a much more relaxed um, set of regulations. It allows you to, um, to leave your house um, for most, uh, most normal activities. Most businesses are open. Uh, restaurants and bars are still closed. Hair salons um, and other sort of personal care services are still closed. Uh, but most uh, normal economic activity or, or a lot of normal acti economic activity has resumed. Um, and as you can see, um, as we've been lifting restrictions and, and opening things up, um, the, the case, cases have essentially been growing exponentially throughout that whole time, um, unlike a lot of places where there has been a push to um, identify strict criteria for reopening things. Um, the economic pressures in South Africa have essentially forced uh, the government's hand in terms of reopening. Um, in terms of deaths, um, we have exponential growth in cases. So of course we have exponential growth in, in deaths. Um, and I think um, South Africa's trajectory is, is much more typical of some of the larger um, developing economies 
than it is of the major economies like the US and China, um, which I'm sure everyone is familiar with. So it's uh, very similar to what's being seen in Chile and, and India um, and other places where um, although we are uh, more than 75 days since the fifth total confirmed death, we still have essentially um, unlimited um, exponential growth um, in the numbers of deaths and cases. Um, this, is a, a, this is showing the infection incidence risk uh, per 100,000 persons um, by age and gender. Um, and I think that this is a particularly interesting plot because it sort of mirrors that age, uh, sorry, it mirrors the pyramid plot that I showed you before with the um, HIV prevalence. So there's not much known about the interaction between COVID and HIV, um, but HIV is a, um, obviously, or, or as, as I'm sure you know, um, is a disease that affects the immune system. Um, and for many infections, um, there's a higher risk of uh, both infection and disease um, or death um, and or death um, for people living with HIV. And I think that this is one of the sort of early signs that we've seen um, this higher prevalence in women, particularly um, in, in the age groups where HIV prevalence is higher than in men, um, is one of the early indications that we've gotten that um, HIV might be pl playing a role in the COVID epidemic in South Africa. Um, there is some, some more recent, uh, well, this is recent, but so, some additional data that's been coming out over the last few days um, that suggests that there's a higher uh, mortality risk as well. Um, so it seems like people living with HIV might have both higher susceptibility and higher uh, mortality. Um, so these increases that I've been showing are, um, are not just, not just a, a result of increased testing, um, but there has been increased testing through time. Um, so this plot is showing the um, number of daily, the daily number of cases, the incidence in red, um, and the daily number of tests in blue. Um, and you can see that testing expanded um, substantially over the last couple of months. Um, so early on in the epidemic, uh, the government put into place an active surveillance system with community screening and testing, um, in addition to contact tracing of known cases. Um, both of those things are sort of being wound down at this point. Um, there's a, um, a, a major emphasis being placed more on passive surveillance and testing of those admitted to hospital. Um, and uh, de-emphasizing some of the, the more uh, broader testing. Um, and this is really a result of there being limited testing capacity. So um, although there is actually substantial capacity, um, enough sort of mach machines to um, test about 35,000 people per day, uh, which, is a, which is about the level that we're at, um, the um, reagents for the PCR, the, sorry, the reagents for the extraction, um, the, the RNA extraction that's necessary before the PCR test is done, um, have been very hard to come by and have been causing major backlogs. Um, so this is a, a photo of people waiting, um, waiting for COVID tests. This is actually early May um, that, that this article was published. Um, and um, it, as, as it says, people were waiting a petition day for results, um, and as a result, um, we think that the numbers that are being uh, shown are both um, underestimated and probably quite delayed. So the epidemic so far has been mainly concentrated in the Western Cape, um, which is the, um, the province uh, where Cape Town was located, um, and it's been sort of um, there's there's definitely community transmission, but it seems to be um, it, more in some places than in others, as as one might expect. Um, some of the places where there's been substantial transmission, as you can see on the left here, um, are the areas around Tigerbergs and Kailicha, both of which are very highly um, densely populated areas um, with um, very poor populations. Um, so this, these photos um, are both photos of Kailicha, um, which is one of the areas where uh, there's been a lot of spread. Um, the, um, I guess the, the things that I'd like to highlight are um, that there are, it's very crowded living conditions. So these are um, what are known as informal settlements. Um, 
And so people have essentially built, um, built shacks um, right next to each other. Most of these um, houses are one or maybe two rooms, um, and they often have uh, families of sort of five to eight people living in them. Um, and the, um, the sort of rectangular, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the, these um, along the fence line here, you can see um, these sort of rectangular things. Those are actually um, essentially porta potties. So um, they're most of these, um, in most of these houses um, don't actually have their own bathroom facilities um, and don't have running water and plumbing. Um, and so you can just imagine how a pathogen um, that is as transmissible as COVID-19 might move through these populations, um, even in a situation where um, there, there's a stringent lockdown, um, people are really not able to maintain the type of hand hygiene um, or social distancing that is uh, really required in order to um, limit the spread of the disease. And so um, I think this situation is very different from, from probably most of, um, you know, most of the experience in the US. Um, and it has meant that despite our very restrictive lockdown, we had a, um, we, we've essentially maintained a, a reproduction number above one throughout the course of the epidemic. Uh, and um, I am sure it would be even worse if there hadn't been a lockdown, but, but in some, of the, some parts of the population, um, it really is essentially impossible to control spread. Um, of course, the, the flip side of the lockdown, um, even though I, I think it was um, effective in, in reducing transmission, um, is that there really is an economic cost um, in South Africa um, beyond, I know there's an economic cost everywhere, but I think at a, at a more fundamental level than um, a lot of places. So this is some information from a survey that was conducted by the HSRC, the Human Science Resources Council, um, which is a, a government research institution in South Africa. Um, and it's just highlighting that um, that really the lockdown um, it the 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 informal economy in South Africa is 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 very strong, and a lot of people um, get their livelihoods from sort of um, informal uh, work, including domestic work um, and um, and sort of trade um, informal trade. Um, and during the lockdown. Um, almost a quarter of, of people um, had no money to buy food. Um, more than half of the people living in those informal settlements that I showed you had no money to buy food. Um, and about two thirds of residents from townships, which are, which are not informal settlements, but are still historically disadvantaged areas, um, also had uh, no money to buy food. Um, and um, so I, I, I guess this is really just to highlight the the strong um, economic pressures that are being balanced against the, um, the disease risk and the difficult choices that are having to be made in this context. Um, so in terms of um, thinking about exit strategies, um, this is a sort of risk adjusted strategy, a summary of the risk adjusted strategy that the South African government uh, sorry, proposed, um, which basically has five levels where we started off in level five and we've been, um, loosening restrictions as we go along. Um, but unfortunately, those economic pressures, uh, well, fortunately, or, or I think unfortunately, uh, those economic pressures have really meant that, um, that the restrictions have been lifted uh, faster than would, would be wise um, if you were just thinking about the, the disease risk. Um, okay, and I think that's basically all I wanted to say. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, and I'm happy to take questions.